Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. This podcast series is brought to you by Morningstar, offering you technology and services to support your end-to-end financial advice process, including product research, investment data, and comprehensive financial planning technology through AdvisorLogic. AdvisorLogic offers you simple yet powerful tools to run your business, deliver holistic advice, and build trust with clients. You can experience an industry-leading digital advice offering. Simply select pre-built strategies, compare products, and generate your advice documents within a single guided workflow. Welcome back to this, the fifth and final episode in our series on innovation using technology brought to you by Morningstar. And if you haven't, uh, if you haven't started the series at the, the first episode, then I recommend you go back and start at episode one of this series. Uh, this is episode five, but we really cover off on all things to do with the change management side, uh, the change management process of implementing new technology into an advice practice. Welcome back to this episode, Phil Thompson. Thank you, Fraser. <laughs> Thanks. I never know what you're going to say. You're always like, I'm on, I'm on, I'm on edge. <laughs> That's good. Uh, we are talking about all things change management when it comes to software and you know efficiencies and putting things in place. Uh, and you're somebody who, uh, as you've mentioned in the previous episodes, like to um, you know continually review your software, make sure it's it's right, continually uh, upgrade if it's necessarily, and, and sort of put that two year time frame in place to say, well. Even if uh, even if it's working all right, it's been a couple of years, so we need to upgrade it. Uh, talk to us about change management. Yeah, change management is funny because for me, I the way I think about it is how do I communicate to the team? Now, it forever surprises me that people can't read my mind. Um, it's very disappointing that my team can't read my mind, but it is true. Um, so for me, I just I think about and keep and, and need to remind myself all the time that I've got to keep communicating what I'm doing and just like just drill it into my team and be a broken record about anything because I think I've spoken about something 10 times and my, and I still get team members going, oh, what's going on there? I'm like, haven't I communicated this? No, because I've communicated to, I said it once in a t- all team meeting and then I said it three other times with other team members. Um, so just be like a broken record when I'm, when I'm talking about the expectation that we, when, when using the software, um, what's, you know, the plan is moving forward. Um, so for me, it's all about how do I improve my communication as, as a leader? Yep. And, uh, and do you have a bit of a culture in your business? Obviously, if you're, if you're constantly improving stuff, I think, I, I guess your team will sort of get used to the idea that, that there, there is a bit more, um, a bit more disruption or momentum ca- uh, change coming along, uh, the pipeline. Yeah. I mean, we've grown a lot in the last few years. So we're bringing on team members and, and change and like everything we're doing has been changing every time week for the last two years straight so it's kind of been good now as we start to mature as a business a bit more i am thinking about how do we keep how do i keep communicating that we are wanting to change we are wanting to do things differently and so you know october 1st with this um income protection deadlines like we were crazy busy and we weren't able to make many changes when there were issues well we've got to put up with it and so post october or post first first of October, it's a matter of going, okay, how do we re- reset it and go, all right, we need to change things. You know, these are all the issues. This is how we're going to improve what we're doing. Yeah. I mean, the, the team the team are amazing. Um, they, they also want to improve the process as well. Like no one wants to do the same thing the wrong way all the time. So, yeah, for me, it's just keep communicating what, what we need to change and, and why we need to change it. Fantastic. So, improving the process, I guess, is the uh, if, if if everybody's focused on that, then um, you know, the culture of uh, continual change is okay. Yeah, and I and I keep on saying to my team, well, I probably don't say it enough. I, I keep on thinking it, and they don't read my mind. But I keep on <laughs> um, thinking that you know, I just want to hear about the issues. Like, um, I don't want you to whinge to me. I mean, you can whinge, and I'll pat you on the back, but. I want you to communicate what are the issues. You don't need a solution to that issue. I just want to know what you're finding difficult and what you're doing all the time because there's, you know, really one of three outcomes from that. 
I'll say, yep, go fix it yourself. Um, or yes, let's work on this together and, and we can work on how to fix it. Or no, we're not changing it because, you know, there's five other pieces of the puzzle that it impacts and, and it will negatively impact it. Um, so I just, yeah, I always just want to hear what are the issues? Where, what are you struggling with? Um, and so I can kind of work with them and try and solve their problems. Yep. So you work with them, solve the problem, work out uh, what what the solution might be, make a decision, uh, and then then there's the onboarding process, I guess. To talk us through how how that can work. Yeah. Sometimes there's can be reluctance. Like yeah, I used an analogy once with my team that was it was pretty gruesome, um, but it was like there is an issue that we have in their business. Now it happens for one in every like ten clients where they don't disclose something that they should. Now, our solution has been to, you know, you can, the, the saying is you can always, you know, lead a horse to water, but you can't let them drink. Now, what we do in our business, and my analogy was, we're not just leading them to the water, asking them to drink, picking up a bucket, shoving it in their mouths to forcing them to drink. If they still don't drink, we walk two hours, get a hose, bring it back and shove it in their mouth and force the water down their mouth with our clients. And so let's just also just reinvent the way we sometimes do stuff um, because even though sometimes my team don't think it's really a problem, it's just something that needs to happen. Well, actually, it doesn't need to happen. Let's just always question, do we actually need to do this? Is it a helping the clients have a better experience? Is it helping us be more efficient? And is it a compliance issue? If it's not one of those three things, then we actually may not need to do it. So, like, team members may not think it's an issue. They just think it's what we need to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. And you know, you're you're right with the three uh, the three different areas, and uh, and the analogy. Uh, I think I, I think I heard that saying before. The idea of um, you know, you take a really bad uh, a really bad process and you make it more efficient. It's just bringing that bad bad thing sooner. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so it's about sitting back and working out whether the experience is going to be good first, and then and then uh, and then creating the efficiencies around it. Yeah, fantastic. Now, talk to me about how when when you're implementing and you you, you know the training side of it, because obviously a fair amount of I would imagine in your practice a fair amount of time goes to training for new software and new new processes. Yeah, no, well, not as much as we should. There's definitely an area that that I can be doing heaps better in um, is is training on software because that's I guess our core software. Our team do it really well, but um, that ongoing training of like, hey, these are features that you can use. Um, we don't do anywhere near as well. Um, and again, my team should really just read my mind and, and that'll, that'll help. Um, but outside of that, um, definitely need to dedicate more time on training. And, you know, there's, there's a few things like in the last week or two, I've kind of just recorded a, a loom video and say, Hey guys, like, did you know you can do this? This is an easy way to track, you know, this information that we need. And, you know, a lot of the team members may not have realized they could do that. Um, so that's the way I'm thinking about all these little things because we haven't had the capacity all the time to sit down and have a group kumbaya and our session to talk about training on software, but just little tidbits here, I can just record a video and, and show them how to do it. Yeah, fantastic. And uh, and apart from mind reading software uh, for yourself, and or, or nice. maybe, they, maybe they can listen to this podcast and then find out what's happening in the business. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> tell us about what the future holds. Have you got any uh, big plans or big changes coming? Oh, we've got huge plans. We want to take over the world. No, we'd not take over the world. But, I mean, we we really just think about how do we, um, like, as a business, we want to be the preferred partner to financial planners with their insurance. My view is insurance advisors are going to get out of recommending insurance. Too hard, make less money, too much of a risk. And, and how do we be that preferred partner for those advisors? So that's kind of the way I think about it is, our, our end client is always going to be our client, but um, communicating to those referral partners on an ongoing basis at a time of which suits them is also an area that, I mean, we already do that with, with referral partners, um, but that's kind of a, an area of growth for us. That's where I see, see a, a big part of my growth. Yeah, fantastic. So obviously part of efficiencies is the, the idea of scale. How are you going with being able to scale your business? Um, pretty good. Every day I think about how there's – a list as long as my arm of things we need to improve and we can do better. Um, but we've been able to scale really well, better than I ever thought was possible. I would say what's your growth? You've, you've come a long way and you're at a, at a point where you're able to, you know, um, talk about uh, 
helping clients it just it, the numbers you're talking about is um as far outweighs anything i've ever thought of from a risk business mm, yeah fantastic phil thanks for coming on i uh, really appreciate it. if somebody wants to continue the conversation what's the best way for them to reach out to you just connect with me any way you want philip james thompson is my name i'm on facebook linkedin um twitter google plus um myspace <laughs> Uh, get in touch with me however you want <laughs> well that's some great technology you're using there is that your hotmail account as well was it or you that's it i do yeah. phil j tomo at no i don't even know my old hotmail email uh, address fair enough too uh thanks mate or they can send you a letter probably that's probably that's a good it, one yeah. yeah i won't get uh, that that's for sure really appreciate it thanks mate awesome thanks buzz thanks for joining us again jody douglas thanks fraser Thank you for being here. Now let's uh, let's dive in. We're talking about change management, uh, and obviously you've got some pretty great systems in, in place already that we've kind of covered off on uh, when it comes to change management. Yeah, I love change. Me myself, I I get bored unless things are changing. So change management for me is all about embracing change, being adaptable, being ahead of the change. Um, is where. It's so much easier to deal with change if you know it's coming. Yep, the old the old constant. And I guess uh, I guess what I can what I can hear from talking to you is it's really a culture within your business. It definitely is hundred percent culture. Um, anyone that works at Mad About Life and is a part of the team knows that Mad About Life is always striving to be different. Um, we are a practice. I mean, I have a um, slogan on my LinkedIn profile, which is all about the future of advice. Mad About Life is about the future. And that's about building an advice practice that has been adaptable and is adaptable to anything that's coming towards us in the future. Yeah, and I guess that change or that, um, you know, moving from a status quo just means not only are your staff, uh, you know, adaptable to, to change as it comes, but also is that something you also talk to your clients about? It definitely is. So our clients also love that about us. They love that we're always striving to be more efficient. They know that that's part of our culture. Um, so it's, it's within our team. It's also within our clients. They know that, you know, we're, we're there with them. Um, we're a partner for life. And as things change in the industry, we're there to help them through those changes and to guide them through those changes. Quite often they, they know, you know, mad about life is all over that because they're ahead of it. You know, it, it doesn't affect them because we already know about it. Yep. Fantastic. Now, obviously, when it comes to having, you know, 10 different pieces of technology in your technology stack from time to time, I guess you'll probably change them out as, as new technology comes along. How, how, how do you go about the process of say, and, and I love that what you said before about um, not holding on to the old, if you're going to make a change, commit to the change and, and do it and then go through the process uh, and then don't hold on to the old system as well. You don't, uh, you don't need it. Um, talk to us about the, your process that maybe in the past or what you do um, around, you know, changing or swapping out one piece of technology for another. Yeah, definitely. So it's all part of the testing process. So it, it's quite obvious when there becomes a need that we need a new tool. Um, and there's that question first, well, hang on a minute, does the current tool have the ability to to change? Do we know enough about it to be able to use it? And then if not, let's look at what we can replace it with. And then we replace it whilst it's also sitting there and we train our team members and we start using the new tool. And then once everybody's using that, which is usually only a matter of, you know, weeks that we notice that nobody is logging into the old one anymore. And at our monthly meetings, we then go through our list and make a decision to turn off uh, any old subscriptions. Yeah. Now, t turning off, I guess, uh, as you, you've already mentioned that you don't store any data in the in the systems, that's your source of truth is within the CRM. Um, so, you know, if that's the case, you know, maybe, a, you know, a a please sign or a, you know, or a text magic or anything like that, that all ends up in your source of truth and you delete anything else. So if you do choose to move on from a particular software and replace one with a, a newer technology that offers you better benefits, uh, you're not, yeah. um, you're not having to lose any data. That's right. Exactly. Like please sign, for example, could, you know, not work tomorrow. If it didn't work, it wouldn't affect us. We've got everything stored within the client's file in Advisor Logic. We just need to quickly find another digital signature software that we could put our documents into. So our our documents, our templates, our client file information is all within Advisor Logic. These systems just allow us to be more efficient. Um, and that's a decision that we've made is not to rely on them in terms of losing any data or anything like that 
that they're just a tool for efficiency. Yep. Brilliant. And you've already mentioned training. We'll cover often again on training on this particular episode because training is such a big, important part to that change management process. Tell us about um, tell us about that. You, you mentioned the time you that your staff will put into training and how much time you ask your staff to put into training and software. Yeah, that's right. So it's something that we do as a team because change and training are not things that you will prioritize. You'll you'll always prioritize the business as usual and go, oh yeah, I must do that training. And if you do that, you never ever get around to it. So instead we approach it as a team. We do team training whenever there's any changes. Like this week, I will be sitting down with the whole team to take them through the new DDO requirements. Um, I've obviously as the responsible manager, all over that, um, but we'll sit down together to then break it down. It's not individual learning. I find that training as a team is always much better. It's how I learn as well. I love to do team training rather than one-on-one training. Uh, so yeah, embracing it as a team culture, I think is the key. Yeah, that's incredible. And you, you, I, know, I know you mentioned your testing process before, but talk to us about the 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 step by step process part of that. If we get nitty into the nitty gritty of what does the testing process look like, um, and the exactly the time and the, and and you run it as a project. Yeah, that's right. So it becomes a widget within our planner tool. And Mike, our head of IT, is in charge of that. And what he will do is if any of us say within a team, we're getting really frustrated with this uh, process, this is what we need, he will sit with us uh, so that we can show him exactly what we needed to do and where our frustrations are. Um, and his knowledge is maybe very limited in terms of that, that process, but he'll sit down and understand exactly what our user requirements are. He will then go away and have a look at the current software we're using and then do some research into other tools and then come back to us, um, usually individually, to let us know where he's at and then again at that monthly team meeting to update everybody in terms of what he's found. And sometimes it's not what we want to hear. Sometimes it's, sorry, I can't fix that problem. Um, This is the best we can do with these couple of, um, you know, things not being possible. I think one of the benefits of this is he brings it to a resolution, right? He brings it to a decision. So not just sitting on a limbo, sitting in, oh, I'll get to that. It goes, no, here it is. Here's the requirements. It does or doesn't. The answer is yes or no. The the decision is do or don't. And then, we, you know, you've made the decision. You can move on. It's so good to be able to delegate it. That's the key. Like, because otherwise you'll be sitting there as an advisor doing things the same way, getting frustrated, going, oh, I wish this was better to be able to actually delegate that to a mic, for example, and he goes away and sees what's possible and comes back and gives you a solution. Yeah, it's worth its weight in gold. Yep, fantastic. Now, talk to me about any future ideas or efficiencies that you've got on your mind that you might uh, might see us in, in years to come saving us a lot of time in the advice process. Yeah, I think the statement of advice. Statement of advice has been around for a very long time and a statement of advice was always a written document. Um, It's a statement. However, evolving that now to still be a statement of advice but in a more digital manner, um, which we're already starting to do, so we're well equipped for when this does happen. I believe the statement of advice is going to evolve away from a paper document into something more digital, like a video, um, something that people can understand without doing too much reading. Uh, people nowadays don't want to read 100-page documents. They would prefer someone explain that to them. Um, so how can we do that in the future? I believe that's going to be the biggest the biggest change and one that's welcomed by many um, in an advice practice where that statement of advice development, uh, just the document itself, is taking so much time. I think that's going to be a, a very welcomed change in the near future. I couldn't agree more. And I think you just made a statement right there without writing a single word, uh, <laughs> uh, which is exactly what we can do in statements of advice. Uh, use uh, use video, use voice, uh, use other memes, means of of uh, Providing information to state your case, I guess, is the uh, the key to it. Most definitely, uh, Jody. Thank thank you so much for coming on the series and talking about all things, you know, efficiency and technology. If somebody wants to continue the conversation with you or find out more about your ideas and opinions, what's the best way for them to find you? 
Sure thing. I'm on LinkedIn, so please connect with me. If you just search Jodie Douglas, you'll find me on there. Um, I've also got my contact details on there and you can also email me, um, which is as simple as Jodie, J-O-D-I-E at madaboutlife.com.au. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks, Fraser. Welcome back, Mitch. Thank you very much, Fraser. Good to speak to you again. Fantastic. And uh, in this episode, we're talking a lot around the, uh, the, the the human side of it, the change management that goes on within a business when uh, when the business does go through some some change and some software change. Sure. Uh, so tell us about your business. You've obviously been through, there's, there's a lot of change going on, a lot of growth going on. Uh, how, how's the change management process going? Yeah, so for us, uh, when we look at change management, um, I've alluded to this in the, in the previous episodes, our business is going through a significant state of flux, right? So We've gone from a small business and the ability to pivot and be extremely dynamic in what we do and there being a very limited detriment to to uh, then backing out of whatever decision was made too because the you know when you've only got a couple of lines out um, it doesn't it doesn't take much to sort of bring them back in um, but the pace for us has really increased due to the changing size and scale of the business. Um, and it's become more and more crucial for us um, to ensure that there's a really specific project management framework in place um, with with timelines and implementation journey that's really outlined uh, when any of these sorts of things um, come, you know come up and, and we're looking to roll them out. Um, a lot of that has meant making way for specialists in the business because you know, you know the, the myself and the management team are only a, a couple of you know a couple of people and we don't attest to know all things um it's probably really sound to to spread some of this load around between different value sets goal sets and, and key competencies of the people around me and just letting people it, it's no good just letting people loose on the technology that you need to be employed so the the project management of it getting in place, making sure that there's a specialist in the business and really setting up some clear guidelines around it has been uh, extremely important for us. Yeah, fantastic. And uh, you, you sort of touched on the, the idea of training there and getting new staff across uh, new systems. Uh, how, how do you go about that? You, uh, you sort of mentioned that you've had, uh, you, you you know, you get a one person really trained up on it first and then and then what do they t- take the rest of the team through? So we run, a, we run a fairly significant training schedule in our business and, and it's probably a, a bit of a function of the times at the moment that we really need and want to have everybody together. And it's quite cathartic to have a group of people on a call that you can speak to other, other than the, the couple of people that you're stuck in a little box, box in at home. But um, we run a fairly um, strict, I wouldn't say strict, but a fairly uh, reg, uh, regimented sort of training schedule where we have um, – regular catch-ups every week with the ability for individuals to put new training aspects of training and, and, and some, whatever um, uh, potential lacks in in their, their skill set or whatever it might be, be that individual or as a group, um, into the mix for training. So we will then – so this, this, this is not just technology. This is just the way that we conduct the business. We create forums where if there is a deficiency across anything that we have – um, we have the ability for the specialist to come in and do that, and we and we see that done quite often. But the training structures that we tend to run is you're exactly right. In our in our specific areas and regions, we will tend to have one specialist in the office that at any stage can be employed to to be that troubleshooter or to be that subject matter expert. But we've been, and we've been really conscious of that because. Coming from the small business mindset um, to now a business where we've got 12 and soon to be more advisors, um, 40 plus staff in total, um, we need to make really considered decisions now because if we don't roll this out properly and we don't really put our best foot forward, we find ourselves in a position where to unpick something like this if we can't get it to work is that much harder now with size and scale comes some serious benefits and we can lean into this stuff because we have you know the the capacity to do it from a number of different aspects and we can look to do it initially without seeing a return right we can we can do things with a real future lens and not have to see a, a return straight away but if we do that and we wade into it and we don't manage it into place effectively, to unpick that once you've integrated it into everything that you've done is 
probably more costly than the initial uh, activity that you've undertaken in the first place. Yeah, it's, it, you're absolutely right there. And I like the idea that you sort of mentioned this as a project management process and to, to create a project out of it uh, and implement it and and then track, I guess, track it along that process and say, right now, you know, this is, we're going to take some time, we're going to make sure this gets done properly. Oh, absolutely. And, and mate, we've, we're, we're really, that's one thing that I would say that we're really quite good with. Um, could get better. And, and I, I spoke about it, I think it was either in our last chat or the one before, uh, the data aggregation piece and, 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 and getting that zoomed out lens of the business. That's going to become even more important as we start to try to as we start to employ more of these other ancillary and and periphery type um, solutions because there's another aspect to this as well and irrespective of how hard it might be and I know anybody in the tech world that that may listen to this isn't you know might not necessarily be happy with what I'm about to say but you've got to be ready to rip the pull the ripcord too if it's not working and the synergy's not there, and it's not making the boat go faster, the square peg into a round hole never works. And it's no, it, it's, it, you've got to cut through the, the fog sometimes and, and, and cut through the relationship and the promises that were made and, and, and the potential you know, financial loss that you may need to recoup. And you really just need to know when it's time to pull the ripcord and it's not working and it's actually slowing the whole thing down um, and 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 how to look then for a new solution rather than just persisting and persisting potentially to your detriment. Yeah, that's a really good point. Thanks, thanks for that one. Uh, now the next thing, I guess that we'll probably finish on this, but uh, tell us about um, the any future ideas around um, you know that, that, what, what are things that you'd love to see happen in the business um, from efficiency and, and technology point uh, in the future. Well, I think it's probably. I think now uh, we're at a, in a position where we've focused. We are focusing a lot on um, the advisors and the increase, uh, the advisors and, and support within the business, and making sure that we have all of the uh, data coming in. So we have a lot of raw data now. I'm not that good with Excel, so <laughs> from a management perspective. Uh, the next step is it's great to have the data there, but synthesizing that into something that is e easy to use and manipulate, um, pertinent uh, and, and one touch accessible at any stage for live data so that we can really track um, the efficacy of some of the things that we're doing, be that on the technology front or any of the other changes that we're making. That's probably the next step in the evolution of where we're going to go with technology, I'd say, Fraser. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, ha having uh, having a great dashboard uh, at your fingertips. Hey, Mitch, thanks so much for coming on this series. Um, if somebody wants to continue the conversation with you, what's the best way to reach out to yourself uh, or personally or as part of our Coastal Advice Group? LinkedIn would probably be the best way. Um, Mitchell Ramsbotham uh, on LinkedIn. I'm probably friends with a lot of the people based on my my background in the, in the industry. I'm probably uh, connected with a lot of the people online anyway, but Always happy to chat about anything that we're doing, any questions that anybody might have or any suggestions too. You know, as I've said throughout this whole thing, we don't attest to know everything. So if there's anybody that is uh, a couple of steps ahead of me in the evolution of their business, um, I'm, I'm absolutely happy to have an olive branch extended and, um, and to, to share the love and, and to hear some of the successes that the other people are having too. So please reach out. Thanks, Mitch. Thanks, Fraser. Welcome back, Vicky. Welcome back, Fraser. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for welcoming me back. No uh, look, at this episode, we're talking about all different things around change management. And we all know that from small business to large business, when it comes to, you know, a decision's been made, we now have to now dive into a process where we're going to implement the change. Uh, and that comes with a whole lot of ideas and personalities and, and, and people and processes to implement. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's it's it's... So it's so for small business as well as large business. Tell us about how you go through the change management process within Telstra. Sure. We're probably steering away now from um, those formal change management processes. There's, there's departments in HR that obviously give us some uh, change mapping and decisions. But really, we like to um, do things like a journey or an experience map. Um, so we won't do that with the staff first. We'll do that using a lot of persona mapping. So that's basically um, using person X, uh, you know, 20-year-old who's been in Telstra for a year is about to go through this. 
uh, and we'll, we'll run that persona through and all sit there and evaluate how that experience may be for them. And that shows us then um, the places where that change may be more difficult uh, or um, sort of red flag um, to us for that particular cohort of how it's going to be. Um, and yeah, and, mostly. And oh, you go. Mm. So then, is there? So does that mean that you would look at a whole lot of different personas and say, "Here's yeah." Yeah, and even with the customers, we probably have two hundred and fifty or so um, persona profiles that you can use um, that are based on factual data of our customers or our staff or our um, yeah our future workforce, uh, and we can run them through these journey maps, which is um, pretty important because we tend to just decide we know what's going to affect them. Uh, whereas when you do a journey map and you actually sit back and take the journey of what it's going to be like, uh, it, it actually pulls out a lot of different um, factors that you may want to consider. Yeah, that's an absolutely interesting. And and so you at this point, often we've made a decision, now, haven't we? We've made the decision now we yeah. just need to implement the change. Um, yeah. do, do those personas come into it when it comes to the decision-making process as well? No, once we've sort of decided, I think we go live <laughs> we, and um, we'll probably use things now. We try to do a lot, hold a lot of sessions um, with things like a rose thorn bud process. So even though we say it's going to happen, we'd love to hear those little gems, the rose, the things that you think are positive about what's about to happen. And we try to use the word thorn a bit prickly, something that may be a bit negative to you, but we'll probably use the word prickly. So it's still there on the rose and it's not going away. Uh, but we want to try and see if we can make it as painless as we can. Uh, and then the bud is the big one. That's where people feel like they can um, add to it or add to the potential of the solution you're offering them. And those um, buds quite often can get implemented. So it's like we're not going to, we're still going to do the rose, but you know, we've got other things there that you think could blossom or make it better. We'd love to hear from you. And that comes out in our employee satisfaction scores and things like that, where people feel they've been heard or um, that they had the opportunity to be heard. Um, so yeah, we try to use those really simple techniques and, and it finishes on a really nice note of the bud being the potential of the idea. Yeah, well, that's really good. Uh, that's a great structure, rose thorn bud. Um, yeah, you don't want to so, go rose. You don't want to go rose bud thorn because then you end on the prickly stuff. So. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's the uh, it's the sandwich, <laughs> isn't it? It's the uh, the prickly one in the middle, and then uh, start, what, was the, what was the old compliment sandwich? Start with the compliment, yeah, no, then you get yeah, the feedback, and then you yeah, fair enough, <laughs> rose thorn bud. Because um, obviously, a lot of uh, change tends to disrupt momentum. It's it's like they're taking one step back and then two steps forward. Mm -hmm. um, how do you quantify or qualify that sort of momentum loss versus the gain? Mm. So the, the people change is normally the harder one out of those. Uh, we can change direction with what we're building and our people tend to be quite dynamic. We're saying, okay, I get it. And we're going to go for solution X because they're quite technical. Uh, but people change, even just who's managing my leave and my time or where am I going to sit? Uh, those things um, have a massive downtime. Um, so hence why we try to make those in those quarterly cycles and everyone has an expectation. So expectation management um, is the biggest one. And probably uh, really changes the, the fear of what the consequence is. So if there's no consequence to you personally for this change, you tend to find people have less fear and then they behave in a much more open way. So we try to call out that there's no consequence. You're moving, Vicky, you're going to move from team A to team B and it's an amazing opportunity. There is no consequence. You're not losing your job. You're not <laughs> you know, going to be working in a, another state. Um, so my fear goes down and then I embrace the opportunity. That's the way we try to do it. Fantastic. And uh, any uh, any sort of big future um, ideas or plans? You know, obviously we talked about the bud, the opportunities mm -hmm. at the end. What, what what sort of things do you see in the future with when it comes to um, change or or the the process around change that uh, that, that you see coming out? Yeah, and look, Telstra have not implemented this, but I did some um, private consulting work with um, another lady who um, we're looking at agile in every form. So imagine being able to, um, almost like an air tasker, I think it is, uh, where, for example, a Virgin Airlines pops up all the flights that are available to be flown and the pilots pick and choose and draw down the schedule that they would like. And obviously we need X number of flights between Brisbane and Sydney eventually when we're all out of lockdown. So you maybe have to choose six from column A and that's a mandatory requirement, but then you pick and choose your workload. And if we could bring that into these big businesses where people actually draw down the work they want, again, everyone has to do some from column A and some from column B, but in general, you are choosing the work you bring into your sprint and you get paid accordingly. So um, I see the future being agile in its absolute purest form um, across everything down to what hours I work, what tasks I choose and how I'm remunerated for that. 
Yeah, now this is a really interesting topic for small business as well. And if I'm overlaying this concept of if, if you looked at all the tasks required in a to run a small business and, and to run a financial advice practice. And then uh, in that concept, to be able to put it out to your staff and say, what are, what are all the parts that you really want to do rather than saying, this is your job? Yeah, and they're valued. You know, there's 10 points for this one. You must make up 50 points to get your, you know, your paycheck. Um, and these ones are valued at five. They might be quick, but they're risky. So you pick and choose. And, and in the end, the pile that's left, uh, you sort of all go into it and say, okay, well, these ones have got to be done, so we're just going to divvy them up. But it'd be amazing to see that everything was gone that people chose. And if I wanted a, a light week, I could choose a few easier ones. And the following week, I might be feeling quite energized and feel like on the list, there's a lot of things that resonate with me, so I pick more. Fantastic. Uh, and, and so the, the yeah. concept is, you mentioned week, the concept is that you, it's not just a here's your job, sit and forget. It's, uh, you know, what well, here are all the tasks that are required to be done in the week or the month or whatever the, the mm. sprint period. Hey, um, <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> to, um, to be able to then say, this is our, this is our, you know, what are all the jobs that these people want to do? Um, and it might change. Yeah. And, and we got asked about, you know, how would that work though with um, attrition and, and making sure someone else is skilled in the things I'm skilled in. So you could have there's a bonus card. If you train someone else in something they've never done before, that's a bonus card. So that we're bringing on those skills. And so someone else gets half a point for doing something they're not so good at. But as they're good at it, they move through it and, and get the full bang for buck. Fantastic. Thank you, Vicky, for coming on and sharing your wisdom with us. Uh, as if somebody wanted to continue the conversation with you, what's the best way for them to reach out to you? Yeah, I think uh, LinkedIn would be a fantastic platform to start with. And um, I love the joint sharing. So it'd be um, amazing to have a chat and learn from each other in that space. Thank you. Welcome back, Ivan Gower. Thank you, Fraser. Thank you for being here. Now, this is the final uh, final episode in the series, but we're really getting deep into the idea of change management, which obviously happens to be a lot around both systems, processes, and the humans involved in the change management. Uh, quite often, we sort of get stuck in uh, in the way that we're doing things, and sometimes we can be in the, the status quo and, and going, okay, great, well, isn't it easy just to leave it the way it is? We can. The, the, the old... Um saying the grass is always greener on the other side. Um, I think that uh, it's true when you get to the other side as well. Sometimes you look back at where you were and you say, oh, how, how are we going to move forward? Are we Have we made the right decision? Um, and change, I feel, is the most important um, element of any software decision, implementation, and, and your ongoing use of the software. Yeah. Do you think change needs to be a culture within a business first? Yeah, I do. I do. I, th I think it's something that needs to be taken much more sort of seriously with more discipline than it currently is. Um, change is something that really impacts people on an individual level. So, you know, for for the well-being and the, the general job satisfaction of staff, um, for the um, profitability of the business, getting change right and ensuring that people are going on that journey with you is so critical. There's, a, there's this view that change is coffee and training. You know, if you, how, how do we implement change? Let's have a coffee with somebody. We'll tell them that there's some change and then we'll give them a bit of training. And if you acknowledge like this, there's people whose career is made out of change management. There's, there's a, a role in a lot of organizations. And so there's a lot of science behind change and how we can how we can effectively implement change in any organization uh, regardless of size and in any individual um, and there's a bunch of different models around how you can do it I don't know there's there's one called adcar and I'm not sure whether you've uh, been familiar with it but I'll, I'll take the opportunity to talk you through it's from a business called ProSci, so this is this is not something that I'm clever enough to come up with but um, ADKAR, A-D-K-A-R, stands for Awareness, Desire, Knowledge, Ability, and Reinforcement. So awareness um, is the whole, what, what are we doing and why are we doing it? And in the context of, you know, financial planning software, we, we're changing software. We're going from A to B. The reason we're doing it is X. Um, People need to hear the the message five times. We've talked about that previously. So this is something you kind of got to repeat to people so that they do take it on board and they understand. Um, D is desire. 
do people actually accept this change? You're going to have a very, very tough time implementing change um, if people don't accept the change and, and people don't have the desire to do it. So this is really, this is the pros and cons list where you work through it and you it may, it might even have to acknowledge that at an individual level, this change may not be in someone's best interests, but at the team level, at the business level, it does make sense. So you're kind of acknowledging cons, acknowledging uh, disadvantages for various people um, and for various functions and outcomes, but exploring that in the overall context of, of what we're doing and saying, well, this is really going to be beneficial for us for these reasons, building that desire up. Okay, knowledge, this is the training piece. So this is, this is how you actually educate people around what they have to do. And this is the point where if you don't have awareness and desire, you're going to have people just close-minded in the training session and they're not going to, not going to take anything on board. Um, and A is ability, right? This is where you actually execute and you teach people in a practical sense how to do it. The, the classic example is it, look at any kind of hobby or any sport, right? I've done so many surfing lessons in the past. I've been on the beach, on a board, on the sand. I'm told how to stand up. I know how to do it. Put me in the water with a wave. I cannot do it to save my life. It is so the 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 knowledge versus the ability. The ability really helps you to kind of um, reinforce how you do it and make sure that people can can walk away with the capability. And then reinforcement is, I think, the area that really needs to be focused on because you it's so easy to slip up, right? We know that now, day-to-day -day lives, I start, the, I start the exercise program and I'm doing it diligently until all of a sudden uh, I don't have the energy one day, so I stop and then I fall back into my old habits. Um, the the, the take-up of technology is exactly the same. You're going to experience hiccups. There's going to be some, some instance, and even if it's just something like, you know, the client's coming in tomorrow, we've got to get the statement of advice written and printed and presented. Um, you could do this in the old system, but you've only done it twice in the new one and it takes you a bit longer and the pressure's there and you start going, why can't we use the old system? But reinforcing, we're using the new system for this reason, right? You're almost going back to that awareness and desire phase and going through and repeating. And every time there's a change, it's practices that uh, are requiring other practices at the moment. They're bringing in new people to the business. That's a change. Let's go through that ad car model again and start to, really try and support people through that process so that they're, they're not left behind and not um, struggling to be as effective as they once were. Yeah, that's a very good, that's a very good uh, uh, system. In fact, you know, the idea of coffee and training, I think you're, I think that's a definitely uh, a lot of uh, advisors will be listening to this going, yeah, that's pretty much what we normally do uh, announce it. But uh, that doesn't, that doesn't think about the the uh, the the core underlying human values around safety and certainty and is this going to make change? Am I going to lose my job? All these am I going? Is this going to be hard for me? Um, and just that uh, that ADCAR process, you know, is is a great one for advisors to be able to put in place fairly simply and easily. Um, I, I, you know, when you got to the ability part, I was thinking about uh, my son learning to drive. You know, has to do a hundred hours. You know, that's the thing. And and the hundred hours is sort of a a number that I've heard banded around a few other times, you know, 100 hours of, of ability before you, um, you know, you learn a lot in the first 20 hours, but uh, you do also learn a lot in the second 80 hours. Um, and the reinforcement, I really resonate with the idea of it becoming a habit. Um, as you mentioned, dropping back into old habits is very easy to do. And so for a new habit to to be formed, we really need to to um, make sure that, uh, that, you know, we get that time in the, time in the saddle, I guess. I think so. And listen, I, I, I love coffee as much as everyone else, right? So I, I'm, I'm not adverse to a cup of coffee every now and then, but I think what is really important in in this piece and what, what helps me to kind of step back and, and understand is that every single person in the practice is going through going through this change and everyone will experience it differently. Um, you know, you'll, you'll have your people who um, – 
who who are really being impacted. They've got different processes to follow and 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 life is quite disruptive. There's others who are going to have been experts in the old system and their you know their their value to the practice is based around I'm really good at this and everyone comes to me with with the questions and and you know I'm the champion inside here but all of a sudden I'm back on on level terms with everyone else so how does that affect my worth to the practice um everyone will experience it differently and I think being able to understand that and acknowledge it and help each individual through the process is is ultimately going to support the practice because we like these people. We don't want them to feel disaffected. We we want them to feel like they're valued and we want them to continue adding value and we want the practice to be successful. So, you know, having committed to a change, how do we really embed that now and, and support everyone through it? Yeah, that's a really good point you raise around that the stat the loss of status that somebody might that be suffering from when going through the change. It, it happens across so many businesses and um, and I think you know, the reality is there's people feel a lot of pride in what they've created and in in what they can bring to the table. So um, threatening that pride or being perceived to threaten that pride can um, can be disruptive for somebody and can put them in a position where they're almost actively working against the change, not necessarily consciously, but 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 not supportive, you know, and that that's the desire piece that you've really got to get right and often you know, throughout that ad car piece, you'll get to a point and you'll go, no, we've got to go back and we've got to recommence. Fantastic. Uh, thank you for sharing that with us, Ivan. Really appreciate it. Uh, that sort of brings us to the end of the series. How can people get hold of you if they wanted to continue the conversation? With me personally, um, LinkedIn is, is a great way to get in touch. Um, I love meeting people throughout the industry and hearing ideas and comparing notes. Uh, I do my very best to talk to everyone who who I come across, whether they're considered a competitor. Uh, I've got a very, very um, strong uh, network across all of the people that we're perceived to work against. And I think the reality is that this industry is full of wonderful people who want to drive it forwards and want to deliver the best outcomes for everyone uh, who's here. So for me personally, LinkedIn is great. If you're a a current client of Advisor Logic, um, we do lots of webinars and uh, we have a a healthy CSM force who work with our clients and who I've asked to bring me into any conversation that I can help with. So always happy to, um, always happy to connect and always happy to share ideas. Wonderful. Thanks, Ivan. Thanks, Fraser.